Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Chatham House. I am Robin Niblett, uh, Director of the Institute. Um, a very warm welcome, uh, an especially warm welcome to the US Secretary of Treasury, uh, Stephen Mnuchin. Uh, delighted uh, you be with us today, uh, Secretary. Um, also, Joel Hellman, Dean of the Georgetown uh, School of Foreign Service at Georgetown University, and to uh, many, the many alumni of the school who I know are with us here today, um, as well as our Chatham House members and guests and those joining us uh, on our live stream. Um, this is a special day, and not just because we're open on a Saturday, which is unusual. We're trying to work out what works and what doesn't. Uh, and forgive the building, we're in mid-refurb, uh, um, being a historic building, uh, that takes time. Um, but it's especially important for us to be getting together today because both the Georgetown School of Foreign Service and Chatham House are marking their centenaries. Um, Georgetown started in 1919, having been founded in 1919, the School of Foreign Service, uh, and Chatham House founded in the summer of 1920. Um, we were both established in the wake of the First World War in that period when uh, governments from around the world, but in particular the US uh, and UK governments, were trying to think of ways to build a more stable international system, uh, structures for peace. Um, and in a way, we are at a midpoint of the School of Foreign Services uh, centenary. We're right at the beginning of Chatham Houses. And we thought it would be a perfect way to mark this shared bond between our two institutions, both founded through the idea of dialogue and that special dialogue that was established around the Versailles Peace Treaty negotiations. And the School of Foreign Services set up a series of lectures the uh, Lloyd George Lectures, named after David Lloyd George, who was Prime Minister at the time of our founding, uh, and who worked very closely with President Woodrow Wilson to think through a new structures of dialogue, new forms of international cooperation to make sure it would be a safe world. And those were Americans and Brits who very much led the way at that time of global thinking uh, and leadership. And for that particular reason, uh, delighted that Robert Lloyd George, um, great-grandson, I'm going to say, we were checking earlier, great-great-grandson or great-great-grandson, <laughs> good. Um, I'm glad I got that right, is with us uh, today um, because being able to have uh, a dialogue at the beginning of our centenary year um, of Americans and Brits is important. And for that reason, having Secretary Mnuchin in particular kick off from a Chatham House perspective at the beginning of our centenary year, and obviously for this uh, part of the series of Lloyd George lectures uh, is absolutely perfect. I think you all know Secretary Mnuchin um, was appointed as the 77th uh, Secretary of the Treasury uh, in February 2017, uh, plays a central role in the administration's economic policy, obviously domestically, but as we also know internationally. Um, and I think you've just joined us from the World Economic Forum's annual meeting in Davos, which is where the international part, uh, you've certainly been in the news through that element, and a member of the National Security Council as well as the Cabinet, uh, following a very successful career in investment, banking and finance. Um, a quick word on the format. Um, uh, this is going to be a conversation between Dean Hellman uh, and uh, Secretary Mnuchin about 30 minutes or so, 15 minutes for to get some Q&A and some uh, questions from you, uh, alumni and members of Chatham House, all on the record to remind you, I think as you will probably tell by the size of this room. Um, uh, and I'm going to ask you to please stay in your seats at the end um, because uh, we will have some closing remarks by Jim O'Neill, the chairman of Chatham House, uh, after the conversation. Uh, and after Jim has left with Secretary Mnuchin and Joel Hellman, we will then all be having a reception together. So we can get into the reception. Please stay in your seats at the end until uh, the secretary has at least left the room. Um, I'm now going to welcome everyone up, but I do want to introduce Joel as well, because Joel's become a great partner of Chatham House in this last few months as we've been planning uh, this meeting uh, with the secretary's office. Um, took up the position of Dean of Georgetown School of Foreign Service five years ago, 15 years before that at the World Bank, uh, including as the chief institutional economist, um, and a, a very distinguished career at Harvard, Columbia, and other academic institutions before that. So, Joel, I'm going to let you run the conversation. Uh, Jim will have some remarks afterwards. But uh, welcome both of you to Chatham House. Thank you, Robin, for that introduction. And congratulations to Chatham House on its centenary. Um, we're thrilled to be here and to share a part of that celebration. Um, and thank you, Secretary Mnuchin, for agreeing to come and join us and have a conversation. Um, 
as Robin mentioned, because we are thinking in, in long shifts, big terms, 100 years of both of our institutions, um, and we started at a period in 1919 after the devastation of World War I, when the leaders of the world were gathering together to really rethink the fundamental principles of how the global order um, should be restructured to preserve peace and build prosperity. I want to start perhaps at that large level, and then, and then we get to some more specific uh, current issues. But to ask you what you see at your vantage point now here in 2020, the two or three really major trends that you think are reshaping the world order to some extent as they were thinking in 1919 about the um, trends shaping the world order then. Well, first of all, uh, thank you for having me here, and uh, congratulations to both of you on your significant anniversaries. Um, I, I think there are some very significant issues, but I, I also think there are some basic issues that are going to impact the world. And I think thinking over 100 years is sometimes awfully hard, so I'll, I'll try for more 10 to 20 years. And, and the reason why I say I think thinking for 100 years is the world has changed so much in ways that we couldn't have predicted. And as a general matter, I would say technology uh, advances much quicker than we think about. So a lot of the things that we may think are problems today, um, I think technology will advance those issues. So I would say that the first thing I would say is, is technology. Um, I think it has been very transformational over the 100 years in every single aspect of our economy, our world order. Um, I think some specific issues as it relates to technology, Obviously, it creates issues in certain industries have been created that don't exist. Uh, it transforms other energies. So I think education and making sure as it impacts jobs that, uh, that, that people have the necessary skills. Um, I would also say privacy issues are something. As, as we are more and more connected, both privacy and encryption uh, and cyber issues are, are very important since, you know, I think you know, we're going to be, whether it's a 5G world or, or other things, I mean, we're going to be in the world where almost everything is connected. So I would say technology is an important issue. Uh, the second thing I would say is having access to stable global energy markets. Um, you know, I think if you look at the 70s, the world was very dependent upon oil out of the Middle East. It had significant geopolitical issues. I think if you look at today, and particularly the advance over the last 10 or 20 years, you have the United States now being energy independent and an exporter of energy. That's not something we would have anticipated 25 years ago. You have an abundance of natural gas around the world. Uh, I think natural gas particularly is, is very efficient and is more environmentally friendly than perhaps other carbon. Uh, but the abundance of energy creates great economic opportunities. Uh, I would also just comment, although there's an abundance of energy, there's a significant number of people in the world that don't have access to electricity. So I as much as the environmental issues, I, I think we also have to get more people uh, who, who have advantage of these things. And then the last thing I would just comment on, uh, economic growth and job creation has been very important, continues to be very important. I think that the next generation wants to feel that they have the same or better opportunities. And it, it is important for both on a individual country basis and on a global basis that we are creating economic growth because that's what creates jobs and that's what creates opportunities. And whether you look at certain areas, uh, China, which is, uh, although it's the second largest economy in the world, uh, it has a huge issue, a billion, 350 million people. It still has a huge need for job creation, uh, and whether it's uh, China, India, or other parts of the world. Uh, and, and I think in the United States, one of the things we've been very focused on, even though we have now the lowest unemployment rates in the world, uh, economic growth and making sure that we can create economic opportunities is our priority. 
But you mentioned China in, in the midst of this, and China is going to be an important player in all three of the trends that you mentioned, on the technology side, on the privacy and security issues that are associated with that, on the energy side, as an energy consumer and a producer, and certainly in growth and job creation, given their role as a creditor um, globally and, and, and as, a, as a major and con in increasingly growing economy. Um, how do you see um, your immediate um, tasks in your growing relationship with China post the trade deal, uh, first phase of the fa trade deal, um, to deal with the fact that China is going to be a major player in all of these um, long-term shifts? Well, I think, as you know, I've spent an awful lot of time over the last three years uh, on, on the China economic relationship. Uh, we couldn't be more pleased that we were able to sign a phase, what we call a phase one trade agreement. I think it is enormously significant, both to the U.S. and, and also globally, uh, as the two largest economies. This is, at one, a very important economic uh, relationship. But two, more importantly, I think opening up China uh, to the U.S. and Europe and others, competing on a fair basis is very important. China has a large growing middle class, over 300 million people. That is a great opportunity for U.S., European, and, and other countries and workers. And, and our focus has always been on, from day one, the president's objective has been. And this was the first time we had our summit at Mar-a-Lago with President Trump and President Xi. The president was very clear that he wanted balanced trade. And the reason he, we had, we didn't have balanced trade, our market had been very open to them for investments in trade. Their market had been very closed. So our focus of phase one is, is fair and reciprocal trade. Uh, we have very significant commitments in technology for the first time uh, around forced technology transfer issues, patent protection, agriculture, structural issues financial services, currency protection, and for the first time, an enforcement provision in, in a trade agreement. So I, I think that uh, that will be a major factor helping economic growth this year and going forward. Now, you talked about some of the opportunities, and on the challenges on the China relationship side, one of the issues that you raised in talking of the big picture is on the technology front and what that means for privacy and security. Um, in the negotiations in phase one and what you might think of as a, as a, as a potential phase two, how are you trying to deal with the potential risks associated with how technology is essentially sort of changing the global order and what that might mean for China, a very different political system with very different interests, um, using technology um, uh, in, in a way that we're uncomfortable with? And how do you see that um, uh, playing out in, uh, in your China negotiations? Sure. Well, let me first say again, you know, technology has had an enormous impact in the last hundred years and has changed the world in ways we never fully could have anticipated. So although I think it's an issue going forward, I want to put this in perspective. We've been dealing with these issues uh, in, the, in the post-war environment. And I think like any other relationship, there can be areas where we cooperate and there can be areas where we compete, and there can be areas where we agree, and there can be areas where we don't agree. So I think that's, that's, that's managing a relationship. And as you've said, it's a different political system. Um, we like our political system. They have their political system. But it's important as the two largest economies to be able to work together. <clears throat> Now, you're talking about uh, how we work together. Um, you've had phase one. Um, in Davos, you've talked a lot about the successes of phase one and the USMCA. Um, I wonder, you know, having now uh, achieved those um, milestones, what have you learned from that first phase of engagement on trade, um, uh, on both of those uh, trade deals? Any kind of lessons um, that you've taken from that as, uh, as you think about the next stages of your trade negotiations uh, with them and with others? Well, you know, I would comment on uh, in any negotiation, um, you know, there, there are issues that you just have to be prepared for. And I think one of the things we did was we reached out to a lot of people, uh, both business uh, and in other areas, to make sure that we had the proper input. Some of these issues as it relates to, in China, you know, the U.S. has been dealing with for the last 10 years. Um, I think you know uh, not everybody loves the president's tariffs, but there's no question the tariffs are a very important factor in changing behavior because, quite frankly, whether it was China or other trade relationships, 
that were advantageous to the other party, people just don't like to change. So I, I think that, that the president was very clear from day one that he, he wanted to have open and fair and reciprocal trade. And that was really the basis of our negotiations. Mm -hmm. Now, you mentioned here, and, uh, and I also heard in Davos talking about the role that tariffs played and the threat of tariffs um, in, in pushing the negotiations forward, getting to the table, and getting concessions on some very, very difficult areas. Um, I wonder how you think about the second and third order effects um, of the use of tariffs. Um, the first order effects are getting the deal and getting um, uh, some positive movement on the deal. Um, are there other effects, though, in terms of the longer-term relationship that you have with China or your other trading partners of using tariffs in that way to sort of get the short-term deal? How does it impact the long-term relationship as you might see it? Well, look, I, I, I think that, uh, again, when you look at economic issues or, or other issues, um, I think part of the time is politicians look too much to the short term. And perhaps that's a little bit of because our system has elections. But I think one of the things that the president was very clear on was he campaigned on certain issues. He was prepared to deliver those issues. And he was prepared to deliver them because these are in the long-term best interests of the United States. And I, I think there, there are certain short-term economic issues. But the president was very clear in direction of these are long-term issues. These have been. Dealt, not dealt with over years, and he, he was prepared to deal with them. Mm -hmm. Now, when you think about trade and, and your oversight of, uh, of, of America's role in a trading system overall, right, we know that there's been efforts on bilateral trade deals, and the president has made that very clear, that that's a priority of his to correct some of these um, bilateral deals that he didn't think were, were, were in the interest of the United States, and he's made some progress in that area. Um, I wonder if you might give us a sense of what you think the bigger vision on trade is beyond the bilateral deals. Um, a trade, what is the kind of trade regime that you think this administration envisions going forward that sits on top of um, uh, the bilateral deals, the role of the WTO, um, and how you see that evolving, or some other way in which these bilateral deals um, will sort of essentially add up to a broader trading regime for globally? Well, you know, again, I think. Uh, the reason why the president has instructed us to focus on bilateral deals is just because these agreements are hard enough to negotiate bilaterally that trying to get everybody to the table at the same time, and this is true in, in, in any negotiation, you tend to go to the lowest common denominator to get an agreement. But let me just say that if you look at you know USMCA, which is our largest trading block, so th that was with Mexico and Canada. You look at China, you look at now we're going to be negotiating uh, a free trade agreement with the UK. Uh, you look at we're very focused now on trade negotiations with the EU. Uh, those agreements are the majority of our trade. Uh, I would also just comment we've, we've, we've added on Japan and, and Korea. I don't want to leave them out. So. You know, I, I think our, the president's view is if we can get these major trade agreements done, we can then always roll up the other 10 or 20 percent of trade into similar types of agreements. So it's, it's, it's really as much of a strategy issue of how to get it done than a philosophical issue. And, and from your vantage point, is there a role for the World Trade Organization to play in, the, in this trading regime? And how are you thinking about that going forward? As, as, as many of the audience members may know, I mean, the United States has been blocking um, some appointments to the WTO appellate body that might impact the WTO's ability to play that uh, you know, oversight role on the appellate side. What's the strategy and thinking about the role of the WTO, and where do you see that going? Well, let me just comment on, you know, there's, there's been a lot of important global institutions that have been set up post-war. Uh, the, the WTO is one of them. I know the World Bank, where you, you have a lot of, of history, uh, and the IMF, I think, are also very, very important institutions. So let me just comment. I, I think there is absolutely a role for these global uh, institutions. Uh, having said that, in the case of the WTO, uh, you know, some of these institutions, when they operate on a consensus basis, uh, are very difficult to change. 
And uh, you may have seen in, in Davos, we, we had a bilat with the head of the WTO, and then he participated in the president's press conference. And, and he was pitching to the president, we need WTO reform. So I think there is absolutely a role, but I think, you know, we have to look at a bunch of these institutions, and we should continuously look at how we can bring them into the, the, the new modern economy and, and have them perform appropriately for everybody. And what, what, what are the kind of key areas we'd like to see change in the current sort of structure? Either it's in the WTO or the other international and global institutions. Are there kinds of key areas that you're trying to push in the next stage of engagement with those institutions as you think about what a new WTO look like, or maybe a new um, other global institutional structure? What are you trying well, to get I, in the I next stage? I don't necessarily stage? see the, the role for a new uh, institutional structure, but I, I, I do think, you know, on, on the WTO specifically, it, it's, there are very specific things. So I, I, don't, I don't want to bore the whole, the whole group here, but I, I think the answer is, you know, it needs to, the rules and regulations need to be modernized to have them work. Okay. Well, you did mention the US-UK trade relationship. Obviously, this is gonna be an important um, issue here. Um, Brexit, of course, only days away. I mean, what's on your immediate agenda for discussion um, with the chancellor here um, in terms of where you see the US-UK trade relationship going? Well, I had the opportunity to see the chancellor in, in Davos, and I also had breakfast with him this morning at uh, number 11, so I was uh, pleased to see him as long as I was here. And, you know, the UK is uh, our most important relationship. It's a very strategic relationship. I give this government a lot of credit for they campaigned on, on getting this done. They're getting it done. Uh, and, uh, you know, we've said that, that our goal, their, their goal is to, we're going to try to get both of these trade agreements done this year, and I think from the U.S. standpoint, we are prepared to dedicate a lot of resources. I think the U.K. and U.S. have very similar economies with a big focus on services, and I think this will be a, a very important uh, relationship, and this is going back to the president uh, during the campaign. He said if uh, post-Brexit, they said, you know, they'll be at the top of the list in terms of negotiating. Mm -hmm. Um, is the timing uh, of, uh, of an agreement with the United States versus an agreement with Europe an important issue for you, or um, it was on the top of the agenda for the president? Um, is the timing of this trade relationship something important, and do you have a sense of what that timing might be, given the fact that obviously there's also going to be the relationship and renegotiation relationship with Europe? Um, I, I think the timing is important, and you know we're, we're focused on trying to get this done this year because we think it's important to both of us. And, you know, there'll be certain issues that, that perhaps they need to resolve with the EU before they finalize uh, our agreement. But I think a lot, of, a lot of the issues can be dealt with simultaneously. And, uh, again, we look forward to continuing a great trade relationship. And if anything, I think there will be significantly more trade between the U.S. and the U.K. I, I'd, I'd like to ask you about a couple of the potential sort of stumbling blocks and get a sense of how you're thinking about them. And some of these came up in your conversations in Davos um, as well. I know one of the issues that uh, has been a potential um, uh, issue that you're going to have to confront is on the digital tax. Um, how do you see that relationship both with the UK um, and with Europe um, going, given the concerns that you have already expressed um, on that tax? Sure. So let me just say there's uh there's a disproportionate amount of interest in this topic. <laughs> but, you know, and, and even people talk about the digital service tax, there, there's actually a process going on at the OECD to deal with international tax issues. And, and I think, as you know, international tax issues are very, very important because if it, we, have, we have companies that uh, have global operations, we have different taxing authorities for both the U.S. and other companies to be able to succeed, you have to have international tax agreements that work together so that you have understanding as to both tax certainty and tax allocation. And one of the things we hear from all of our large companies is that there are more and more global tax issues where different countries are trying to fight for revenue allocation. So I just want to put this in perspective. This is one of complex global tax issues that we're talking about. Um, in the OECD process, there's what we refer to as pillar one and pillar two. 
pillar two, I think there's pretty much a, a, a consensus on for a global minimum tax. This is something we instituted in the U.S. as part of tax reform. We call it the guilty tax. And, and the idea is that there shouldn't be a chase to the bottom on taxes. Uh, and, you know, there shouldn't be tax havens that don't charge any tax or charge minimal tax. So I think that, in terms of revenues, is a much, much more important to, uh, issue to uh, all of us. And that, I think, we're pretty close. Uh, on what we call pillar one, th there are complicated issues. The U.S. feels very strongly that any tax that is designed specifically on digital companies is a discriminatory tax and is, is not appropriate and has violations to our tax treaties and, and other issues. So we're, we're, we're working through that. And I think, uh, I think we, we, we have a good outcome of trying to give some room now in 2020 to continue these discussions. Okay. Uh, I, I'm another issue that's, came, that, that's, that's come up um, is on the issue of 5G and 5G technology, again, kind of raising a technology issue um, and the role of Huawei. Um, in, in, put, in, in providing services on 5G. Um, again, how do you see that playing out as the U.S.-U.K. trade um, and negotiations and discussions um, go on? Well, we're having discussions uh, with the U.K. We're having conversations with many of our allies. Uh, if, if you look at the role of technology, uh, it, it is critical that we have infrastructure that's protected. And we have, we have important relationships I mean, I think what's, what's clear is for the role of government, for the role of national security issues, for the role of defense, we want to make sure our infrastructures are protected. And I think on a broader basis, as, as I said earlier, as more and more things are connected to the, to the network and to the grid, uh, these national security issues go beyond the traditional aspects and go into uh, various different aspects. So I think the, the real issue for us is making sure that the networks and infrastructure are properly protected. Um, I also want to ask you, um, you know, I, I think again, another potential, um, you know, issue uh, that will obviously be part of the agenda discussion is, is um, uh, the UK's position on, um, on opening up economic relations, uh, keeping relationships open with Iran um, and the JCPOA. Again, how do you see that playing out in the discussions? Well, I'm, 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 glad, you, uh, I'm glad you asked me that, that question. Um, and this is one of the comments that uh, I made in Davos. You know, there are important issues going on around the world. I think one of the most important issues that is going to affect the next 10, 20, 30, 50 years is making sure that we have a stable Middle East. And the president has been very clear that we can never have a world where Iran has a nuclear weapon. And that we share common objectives with all of our allies. I think we have an absolute uh, agreement on that. Uh, I think the issue of the JCPOA, the president is, was very clear. The problem with the agreement is that it gave them a lot of money and we didn't get the protections in return. Matter of fact, at the end of the agreement, it was going to enable Iran to have nuclear weapons. And the agreement also didn't uh, address ballistic missiles, which uh, is, I'm sure you've recently seen can be quite problematic. So this is a very important issue for us, for the UK, for our European allies, and for everyone around the world. So the issue of uh, sanctions and, and how we apply. We may have had a different view on the effectiveness of the JCPOA, but I think there's, there's no issue between us and all of our allies that Iran can't have nuclear weapons. And I think particularly given the recent events, uh, people understand our position and, and, and we are unified. And I, I think you know that the, the UK and the Europeans have activated the mechanism now that Iran is in violation of the JCPOA. We expect that that's going to go through a process and the UN sanctions will snap back in. And uh, we, we have a common view. But security issues in the Middle East are critical to all of us. And, and these issues, are, 
any of these issues, the taxation, the, the privacy and security issues associated with 5G, um, uh, these issues, um, the associated with, are these like red line um, issues in the negotiations that are, um, uh, that essentially if we do not reach a, a, a positive agreement uh, that uh, works for the president, obviously in his interest, that this is gonna make it very difficult to f find a way forward on the US-UK relationship. How do you kind of see these issues playing themselves out um, in the negotiations as we go forward? I'm, I'm, I'm quite optimistic. Uh, I, I think that uh, the Prime Minister and the President have a very good relationship. I think, uh, I again, there can be areas where we agree 100 percent on. There could be areas where we have issues on. I think that the trade agreement is, is an area where, again, we're both highly motivated. And, and I would just say, on the Iran issue, I think we, we have a common view now of, of where we are. And again, I think the President has been very clear. Well, all we want is an agreement that makes clear they never have nuclear weapons and addresses regional security issues such as ballistic missiles and, and terrorist activities. Now, how do you see the U.S.-Europe relationship um, evolving on trade in particular um, as you move ahead simultaneously on negotiations? Um, and again, from your vantage point, the timing on the Europe side, I, we talked a little bit about from, from Britain's standpoint, from the U.S. side, ha handling both of these sort of simultaneously, how do you see those um, two things evolving and how affecting each other, if they do affect each other? Well, I, th I think, as you know, the president has a broad economic agenda. Trade has been one of the three pillars during the campaign. We developed the economic policy of tax cuts, regulatory relief, and, and trade. Uh, there's no question, you know, just coming back from Davos, there's no question that the U.S. economy is the bright spot of the world. The economic growth that we have is a result of the president's economic agenda, and we'll continue this economic agenda. So, you know, we got a lot to do, and we'll, we'll focus on all of it at once. So the president has made clear now that we got China done, uh, the U.K. and, and Europe are our priority. But I would just also comment, Ambassador Lighthizer is in the midst of negotiating uh, some changes to the agreement with India. So we, we got a lot of these agreements going on at the same time. And what do you think, from, on the European side at least, what are going to be the key sticking points um, in that discussion? What are the kinds of things that you're hoping to kind of move forward in, in terms of the, the, some of the difficult issues that you may be facing um, in the discussions with Europe? We have 150 billion trade balance uh, with, with the, the EU uh, on goods. We do have, uh, we do have a trade surplus on, on services, but we are focused on narrowing that, uh, that trade gap. And again, when we talk about the EU, one of the challenges is um, some of these issues are really only a couple of countries. But I think, as you know, because of the EU, we can't negotiate these things on a bilateral basis. So one of the challenges of dealing with the EU is even within the EU, they have different views. So how optimistic are you, given those differences? Highly um, optimistic. <laughs> Hi highly optimistic. <laughs> What's the cause of your optimism? <laughs> uh, I, th I, th I, think, uh, I think we've shown a great success of getting things done and plowing through these issues. Okay. Well, um, before we're going to go to questions in just a few minutes, um, I want you um, to talk a little bit about, uh, uh, I know that you've, uh, you've still got uh, uh, some time for the, before the elections, but I wonder if thinking beyond the elections, um, if there is a sort of second term and you decide to sort of stay um, in, the admission, in the administration in the second term, um, what do you see as the sort of unfinished agenda um, beyond the elections that you as Treasury Secretary would be focusing on? What are the key points of business that you think a second term will be focused on? Well, I just I would say I do expect there will be a second term, and I've already publicly said that I would stay on uh, with the President. Uh, I think infrastructure is a big priority for the president. This is one of the areas we talked about during the campaign. Uh, we got a lot of things done on a bipartisan basis. This is one of the areas that uh, we have not been able to focus on, and, and that will be a big focus on, of the second term. Mm -hmm. Infrastructure. Um, what do you think of the key threats um, that perhaps um, you see the global growth going forward that might also kind of motivate your thinking about what's the next term? As, as opposed to the immediate threats, you were talking something about the long-term issues of growth. What do you see as the key threats um, to continued global growth that you want to be working on? 
Well, again, I, I think when you talk about global growth and people have these, these global growth statistics, I mean, it, it's really, you know, what are we going to do to have continued growth? And I think the president's economic policies will continue through 2020 and 2021. Uh, I think if you look at, you know, we've had very good increase in wages, we've had very low inflation. Uh, our GDP numbers have been slightly lower than they should be, somewhat as a result of the issues with Boeing, which is our largest exporter, and the fact that we had the GM strike. But I think what's good for us is not only U.S. growth, but growth uh, in other areas of the world, because that creates expanding markets for all of us. And I think in the case of Europe, um, there have been certain policy issues. Uh, you know, I would suggest that Europe uh, develop some more pro-growth economic policies. This just can't be monetary. And, you know, I would comment of, you know, the, the world of negative interest rates, we haven't seen negative interest rates like this in, in this size and scale. Uh, and, look, I, th I think it's hard to have healthy banks with negative interest rates, and I think it's hard to have healthy economies without healthy banks. And what are you thinking about um, uh, uh, the policy towards the dollar? I mean, as you think about kind of the future, um, you talked about monetary policy. Um, as Treasury Secretary, and again, thinking about a long-term perspective, um, uh, you know, what's your approach to thinking about the dollar? Well, let me just say, one of the things I've clearly learned as Treasury Secretary, I'm very careful about my comments on the dollar, because uh, t t two years ago in Davos, I sneezed, and I said something that I thought was completely calm, and all of a sudden the markets went crazy. So l l let me be clear, uh, I support a stable dollar, but I'm not going to make more comments on that. But what I, will, what, 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 I, what, I, what I will make a comment on is the dollar is the reserve currency of the world. Uh, with that creates certain advantages, and with that comes certain responsibilities. So one of the things I, I do spend a lot of my time on, I probably spend half my time on national security, because we manage the government sanctions programs, and the sanctions programs are very effective because the dollar is the reserve currency. And one of the things we balance is, you know, our European friends and allies may not always like what we're doing on, on sanctions, but I do seriously think about that we have a responsibility to use sanctions for important national security issues, but we need to think about the long-term impact uh, on, on the global currency. Well, I want to ask you just a final question before I open it up. And you just came back from Davos. Um, uh, it's often kind of termed as the playground of the global elite. Um, uh, you're talking about two institutions here um, that were forged in 1919, 1920, um, when the thinking at the time really was um, about how to imagine a new multilateralism and a new way of, of global engagement um, in the aftermath of the war. Um, since then, 100 years later, the term globalism has, has, has taken a connotation. I wonder how you kind of define globalism and globalists um, and, uh, and, and what you see as the kind of the issue. Is there, is there a problem with globalist thinking? Um, uh, and how, how should we be thinking about multilateralism outside that context? Well. Um let me just say, because I came back from Davos, and uh, people think of Davos as this globalist entity uh, in preparation for today. I didn't do a lot of prep, but the one thing I did do is I looked up the definition of globalism. Okay. Because, <laughs> <laughs> and what, what it says is the operation or planning of economic and foreign policy on a global basis. That's globalism. Operation or planning on a global basis. <laughs> And I think the president's right in what the president has said many times. The president said he, he represents the American public, and his job is to do what's good for America. And my job as Treasury Secretary is to focus on what's good for America. Now, having said that, that doesn't mean that things that we do aren't good for other people. So, uh, I, you know, I'm, I'm going to take a shot at saying I think, I think this globalism brand, okay, I, I think that perhaps historically in the last 10 or 20 years, um, per, per, perhaps countries weren't thinking enough about their own issues as they were thinking about these issues. And one of the things that the president has been very focused on is, you know, for the past 10 years, wages in the U.S. 
for the middle class didn't go up. Our first objective was creating economic growth and creating economic opportunities. But I think the answer is that we can have both because I think we can do things that are good for us, which are good for global growth. So, uh, you know, I, 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 th I think we got to, I, I do think we have to redefine some of these brands. Uh, another issue, you know, people talk about capitalism. Um, I think, as you know, we, we have an election where we have certain people who like capitalism and certain people like socialism. I, I think some of these issues we, we need to perhaps redefine. Uh, I think kind of economic freedom versus economic controls and planning. And, and I think one of the things we've seen in the US is when you let, you let private business and you let the economy uh, follow through with certain proper incentives, you get, the right, you get the right outcome. Well, I mean, one of the things that's on our minds because of our um, centennial celebrations is when you think about America in 1919 or 1920, it had, be, it had come, become the world's largest creditor nation um, after the war, before the war was the world's largest debtor nation. A lot of the story of 1919 and 1920 was America's role in the world, um, not only as a strong military power and a strong economic power, but as an important player in, a, in multilateral engagement, as a convener of multilateral engagement. And uh, how we, however we define the role globalism and the term of globalism, this notion um, of America's role um, in, in, in sort of essentially contributing to a multilateral sort of framework of cooperation beyond America's bilateral engagements, um, is still something that I haven't heard a lot um, from uh, you or from the administration about how you think about America's role in that multilateral framework. So I'm just, as a, just as a last thought, where do you see America as a convener of multilateralism? Um, or is this not just a part of the agenda as you see it? No, I think, I think it's very important. And uh, you know, let me just give you an example of, of NATO, where the president has been very clear and I think has shown great leadership where We've invested a lot of money in the last three years in our military. Uh, the president has said there was a commitment of 2% to NATO. Why are countries not honoring that, that commitment? So I think that there's very much a role for many of these institutions, but everybody has to be committed. And then the last thing I will just say is, you know, you're commenting 100 years ago. Uh, let, let's not forget there was this little thing called World War II Okay, uh, I'm actually, uh, I'm quite honored. I'm going tomorrow to Poland. I'm representing the president and leading a delegation to Auschwitz for the 75th anniversary of when Auschwitz was freed. Um, let's not forget that 75 years ago, we saw great challenges to the world order. And I, I think whether it's anti-Semitism or other issues, these issues are still very relevant today. So. Uh, I, I think we all have a lot of work to do. Well, look, I'm going to open it up to questions. If you could um, uh, please raise your hands and keep it in the form of a question, please. I'd appreciate it. Um, I'm going to start with the gentleman in the second row, second in. Yes, you? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah hi, uh, Jonathan Paris, a London-based Middle East expert. My claim to fame, uh, Dean Hellman, is that I started at the Council on Foreign Relations at the same year that Charlie Kupchin started uh, 25 years ago. Uh, on sanctions. Uh, most people have been rather impressed with your, your ability to use economic sanctions to pressure Iran. It was much more effective than uh, during the Obama era and even during the Clinton era when there were similar sanctions. How do you explain it? And uh, particularly in internally, how do you handle uh, the deep bench when you lose somebody like Segal, who, 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 who is managing the sanctions process, and yet you you're able to continue to enact just this week, I think you, you, you put sanctions on a Dubai, Shanghai, and Hong Kong company. What's the magic? What's the secret to success in the Treasury Department in this, in this new kind of uh, economic coercion? Well, th thank you. And first, let me comment, uh, for those of you who don't know, Segal was my undersecretary for this area, terrorist financing and, and intelligence. And she did a terrific job and has been a terrific uh, part of our team. Um, when I came into the government, uh, there are certain things that I had a lot of experience in. I had experience in domestic and international finance. As I've said, there are certain things I didn't have a lot of experience in. National security and sanctions were not an area of my expertise. 
when I got there, we have a terrific, uh, we have a terrific team at Treasury of people who have been there for very long periods of, of time. And I immersed myself in studying these issues. I, I kind of refer to it as I, I got a PhD in my first 120 days. So, I, you know, I, I think when I've said as Treasury Secretary, I spend 50 percent of my time on national security. People are normally surprised when they hear that. And, and I'm probably the first Treasury Secretary that's done that. I think historically it's probably been 10 or 20 percent of the job. And the reason, and, and I understood this very quickly, uh, as did the president, the president wanted to have an integrated national security approach. So uh, I meet regularly, uh, and we look at the national security team, Secretary of State Pompeo, myself, Esper, the intelligence community, Robert O'Brien. We have an integrated approach, and the economic side of it is as important as the military uh, side of it. And, and I think the president has been very clear that he'd prefer not to use the military approach in many of these cases. He, he wanted to, you know, take back military assets. Uh, but let me just say, you know, for people who question our strategy, the sanctions have been very important. Um, again, this is not about uh, the Iranian people. We've literally cut off tens and tens of billions of dollars that would have gone to expand terrorist activities. And uh, we hope that Iran realizes they should come back into the world order. There is a great economic future for the people of Iran if they're, if they're, if they're willing to behave responsibly in the world. And, and again, when you talk about world order and global uh, issues, uh, nuclear issues are a global issue. Yes. This lady in front. Thank you very much. Um, my name is Isabella Hilton. I'm a, a member at Chatham House. <clears throat> You've referenced the USMCA several times. Uh, Article 3210 of USMCA attracted some attention when the deal was signed. That's the one that says, if any party enters into a free trade agreement with a non-market economy country, then the other parties are at liberty to terminate the agreement with six months' notice. And the administration indicated very strongly that it would seek to replicate this article in any future trade agreement. Is that still? the administration's position, and what does that mean for discussions with the United Kingdom, which also seeks to have a strong trading relationship with China, a notable non-market country? Well, first let me just comment. I'm very impressed. You've obviously read the agreement, and uh, <laughs> I, 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 I'm, I'm glad you've picked up uh, an, an important aspect. It's, it's one of the many important aspects, but again, you know, USMCA really brought, uh, we think, the, the trading relationship into the modern era. That's one of the issues. The, uh, there's a lot of them. I'm not going to comment on the specific of that as it relates to, but yes, we've, we've broadly said we'd like to use that as a model. Uh, and there's plenty of other things uh, in, in that agreement we'd like to use as a model. But thank you for acknowledging the importance of that. Okay. <laughs> there's a question in the back, the lady in the back. Hi, thank you, Secretary, for your comments this morning. I'm Rebecca Martin, a graduate of the German and European Studies Program here at, um, at SFS, and I'm happy that you can be here to celebrate our centennial. Um, today, there's been a lot of emphasis on economic growth and stability as driving forces of the U.S. economic agenda. Um, how do we balance this with rising environmental concerns and recognizing that we have severe natural disasters both at home in the United States, I'm thinking of the California forest fires recently and currently in Australia and the Commonwealth and most of the continent or large portions of the continent being on fire. So how do we balance that as also a form of a security threat and recognizing that as the ultimate threat to our economic stability? Thank you. Great, thank you. So uh, let me just say, as, as Treasury Secretary, um, I, I do cover kind of very diverse areas in, in, in the government. And it, it, one of the things I like a lot about the job is it spans a lot of areas. But let me just say, um, I am not an environmental expert. So I, I want to be clear. I'm going to make some comments on this. But uh, uh, some of you may have noticed I, I made a comment at uh, a press conference in, in Davos, which was intended to be said somewhat in jest, uh, okay? And I commented in the press conference this was a joke, but seems to have caught a, a lot of attention. 
So let me just make two comments. What I've said in Davos, and in this I absolutely believe, and there was a lot of focus in Davos on environmental issues, um, and, and I think that's fine, okay? But the comment that I made in Davos is there are a lot of important uh, issues that will focus, that impact the world and the economy, and, and I just hope that we balance these other issues and we talk about these other issues uh, as much as we talk about the environment. So whether, as I said, it's, it's issues with Iran in the Middle East or it's issues, obviously a major issue that uh, we're focusing on right now is, is global health issues. Um, you know, we appreciate how China is handling this. I think uh, we're, we're hopeful that this will be contained. So I, I, only, I only say there's, there's lots of issues. Now, as, as it relates to uh, the environmental issues, and the president's been very clear, you know, the president very much supports clean air and clean water. And we've done a great job in the U.S. through technology um, on these issues uh, around energy and, and what we're doing with our, our carbon footprint. I think these are issues that uh, do impact other countries. I've commented, obviously, in the case of China and India, very important environmental issues. Now, your comment in particular about uh, you know, forest fires and things like that. L let me just say I'm, I'm not an expert, so I clearly can't comment on that. I can tell you only in, in the case of California, where I, I did go see these after I went with the president to see the devastation. Um, there are some very specific issues that I know we could be doing in California uh, to prevent the spread of forest fires. I, I can't comment on Australia, but it's obviously been a, a big issue there. Uh, uh, so I'll leave it at that. Uh, I hate to hog the floor as a um, part of Chatham House, but there's one issue I was concerned wouldn't get covered. As you said, the United States um, economy has a global impact. Um, U.S. debt is now 22 trillion, it's driven 10% during the period of the Trump administration, roughly. 20, okay, 22, I, yeah, 22. Um, obviously, that could have structural impacts in terms of the capacity for a second Trump administration to undertake the kind of investment you've talked about. It could have impact on the value of the dollar. Could you just say something about where that sits square within your uh, bailiwick as Treasury Secretary, please? Sure, I'm, I'm, I'm glad you, you asked that question. So. First of all, uh, when the president came into office, uh, we obviously have a lot of debt. A huge component of that was the, the cost of the wars in the Middle East. Um, I think as we look at our debt and our deficits, you have to look at them relative to GDP. Uh, and what I've said, and I believe this, is that uh, it's very manageable relative to our GDP on, on both these issues. But what we have to look at over time is the rate of growth of government spending relative to the rate of growth of uh, our, our revenues. And I would just make two comments on this. When we did the tax cuts, and we did a trillion and a half of tax cuts, that's over a 10-year period, we've said that they will pay for themselves. And we continue to believe that. We're two years in, uh, back-ended. Uh, we are tracking right on our numbers. But the other issue is, when the president came into office, he wanted to increase military spending. We needed bipartisan support. Originally, the president proposed cuts in non-military to pay for that. We were forced to increase non-military spending. So I, I think the answer is that we need to look at the rate of growth. And, and if we're careful on doing this and the economy grows faster, uh, the, the, the answer is we will be shrinking the deficits and, and we'll pay down the, the debt over time. But I think this is an issue for us. I would just comment that, again, going back to economic issues in, in Europe, there are countries that have opportunities to expand fiscal on top of monetary. Monetary cannot be the only economic tool. A question there, the gentleman with the glasses in the middle. Thank you. So I'm David Pollock of Concilium Capital and an individual member and supporter of Chatham House. Uh, you referred in your opening remarks to 
uh, the need for stable global energy markets, and I believe you were quoted at Davos also referring to the need for reasonably priced energy over the next 10 to 20 years. So how much weight do you put on the importance of clean energy for the environment uh, compared with natural gas? As you know, uh, the falling cost and increasing efficiency of renewable energy plus battery storage means that new natural gas plants in the US may not go ahead because they won't be competitive. And in a few years, it's projected that renewable energy with storage will be cheaper to operate than operating gas plants. So, so uh, I, I would just say these are issues that need to have balance. Um, you know, I know Germany just came out with a plan for you know, 2050, and my comments are technology will change a lot over the next 20 or 30 years. So, and, and, and markets change a lot. As, as you've said, re renewables may be more competitive 10 years from now. Battery storage is something that technology is advancing considerably. So one of the issues of, you know, there's obviously time periods where the grid uses a lot of electricity. There's time periods where it doesn't. If over the next 10 or 20 years we have great, uh, great advances in, in battery storage, that unto itself will be tremendous impact on, on energy management. So I would just comment, it, it is important from a global standpoint, having uh, energy that is, is fairly or reasonably priced is very important for economic activity. And technology, I believe, will make that, that more important. So again, there, there are issues all around the world on this. There are also issues, as I said in the beginning, there's a lot of people who don't have electricity. I hope we can advance that. But uh, I, I think we can balance a lot of these issues. Yeah. Gentlemen here on the end. Hey, so uh, Andrew Payne, um, research fellow at Oxford and also council member here at Chatham House. Thanks for your uh, discussion here today. I'd like to return to Iran very quickly because I think that the previous question with respect was a little bit too nice. Um, so you mentioned that the... I did a lot, so now I'm <laughs> I bet you did. Now, now I'm getting nervous about your question with that <laughs> intro. So you stated that the goals in the Middle East were stability and the prevention of Iran getting nuclear weapons. So far, uh, the US strategy, of whether it's sanctions, airstrikes, or on-again, off-again withdrawals, has seen precisely the opposite effect. Increased Iranian influence, pressure for the US to withdraw from Iraq, Iran resuming uranium enrichment, and handing influence to Russia and Syria. So I would suggest that there's zero evidence that maximum pressure is working. Secretary Pompeo yesterday seemed to basically give an answer about blind faith that it's going to be working. So I'm interested in your view on what credible evidence is there behind this strategy working and what specific indicators of success are you looking at? Well, uh, let me say, and you won't be surprised for me to comment, but I disagree with you completely, OK? <laughs> and I did like the other question better. <laughs> but, you know, these, these are complicated issues. So let me be clear, you know, kind of, there are complicated issues. Uh, Syria is a complicated issue. Iraq is complicated. Lebanon is complicated. Um, a lot of these issues existed before the president came into office. A lot of these issues still exist. So, and, and, and there are different issues in, in all of these areas. I, I would say, I, I think there's much more commonality now more than ever in, in the Middle East on the view from lots of countries, from Israel to Saudi to UAE to Qatar to others, on the issue of Iran, okay? And I think that regional stability is, is very important to all the countries there and everyone around the world. And there's no question that Iran has been the major exporter of, of terrorist activities. And there's no question in our mind that if Iran had more money, uh, they would be spreading more activity. So uh, I again, at the end of the day, this isn't a function, you know, this is a function of we want to get to a, a result. And we have complete agreement with all of our allies on this. We want to get to a result where Iran commits it will never have nuclear weapons. It is not a threat to the region in terms of ballistic missiles and terrorism. And I think there's a great outcome for the Iranian people. So 
you know, we'll see. And one final question, the lady with the red, the pink scarf. Hello, Veronique Dupont with AFP News. Um, regarding the UK-US uh, trade negotiations, um, the, gov the UK government is said to be close to giving its agreement to uh, Huawei, at least party, partly. Uh, would that be a major upset? And uh, what about if the UK also uh, enforces uh, the said digital tax? Um. You know, let me just say we're, we're in active discussions with the UK government and others uh, about Huawei. Uh, again, Huawei, is, it's, it's a complicated issue, what parts of their networks it goes into. Uh, I don't want to go through the details, but there are ongoing discussions on that. And, and as it relates to the DST, and I've, I've publicly said this already, uh, it obviously came up at my breakfast with the chancellor this morning. Um, we believe that the DST is a discriminatory tax. Um, we don't think it's appropriate. Having said that, we are, we are working at the OECD to see if we can deal with all these international tax issues. Well, thank you, Secretary Mnuchin. That's all the time we have for discussion and questions. I want to now turn it over to the chairman of Chatham House, uh, Jim O'Neill, for some final words. And I think I'm going to escort you back you. to the chairs, but thank, thank you, you very much. Thank you. Let me say as uh, our two uh, guests here are leaving, uh, my own thanks and both for uh, a very, actually, candidly, uh, a very refreshing uh, and constructively challenging uh, view on some of the issues in the world. Um, I also, uh, before I offer some more reflections and a couple of my own observations, of what uh, the tone of Mr. Secretary Mnuchin's comments have been for the rest of the world. Uh, I want to thank him, myself, for coming here. Uh, it's quite odd, given our own past. It's the first time uh, uh, the Secretary and I have seen each other in a long time. And some of you will know, we were once uh, fellow partners of a certain uh, establishment. And so it's a great uh, pleasure for me. Uh, let me also congratulate you, Joel, on your own 100-year uh, anniversary. But your uh, leadership role in putting this together and helping uh, us at Chatham House uh, have this event for kick-starting what is a, a very exciting year for us. So thank you very much for that. And kind of wow uh, for us as a way to start it. Uh, I must also thank Leslie Vinjamura, wherever she is uh, here, for her own uh, active role in making sure this happens. So well done to you, Leslie, who uh, runs our America's program. Uh, I, I had made some notes beforehand, naively and arrogantly thinking that I'd know what you would say and therefore I could sum up from that, but uh, I've had to sort of throw them away and adjust them. I did think I would start by saying there, was, there were two uh, burning issues of the moment, uh, or, and all, one of them always, or both of them actually seemingly always, that I didn't think you would touch on, uh, one of which was the dollar, but you did, and I'll come back to that in a second. The other, of course, was the, the ongoing demise of Manchester United and the, <laughs> <laughs> the resurrection of the uh, active dislike of the current ownership, but maybe that's for another occasion. Um, on the dollar, I, I have to say, I think I heard you say, Mr. Secretary, about uh, uh, referring to your comments of Davos two years ago about a stable dollar. And I, I want to just offer two observations, given, my, again, my own uh, long-term past. Uh, I do think you have uh, discovered a rather nifty and nimble position when uh, I think of myself all those wasted uh, years trying to figure out uh, what various US Treasury Secretaries, going all the way back to Lloyd Benson, thought about uh, what it meant when they said something about their dollar stance, which is usually one of a strong dollar. Uh, and uh, when I Googled this morning, I, I, I saw that there was only really two references to your view, your comments on the dollar. And you, so you, hopefully with me not now adding an additional challenge, uh, you've seemingly taken the heat out of the, the persistent attention on the Treasury Secretary of that. Uh, but I, the second one, I suspect by saying stable, that might mean for the rest of the world 
don't assume that the dollar is always going to be going up, but that's my own subjective interpretation. Um, moving on uh, and putting my own context of it too, I, I, I think as a, I, I certainly, not that I was at Davos, but I interpret it this way, I, I think on the state of the world, uh, there was a, a view that the world economy had uh, stabilized. Uh, certainly from all the indicators, I've spent so much of my life uh, following, uh, and sad as I am as a human being, still do. Uh, it looks pretty clear to me that in November and December the world did uh, stabilize, uh, with most of the places that have been showing the greatest weakness, China included, uh, uh, showing evidence of, of some modest bottoming out. However, the third thing to say in that regard, and not for the first time, uh, I must add, with Davos, uh, within a short space of time, uh, events, my friend, uh, take over. And with the uh, very troubling uh, coronavirus outbreak in China, uh, it seems to me, uh, even for the, the dominant theme of climate change, uh, that is not uh, the thing that's going to focus the mind of, uh, of policymakers, particularly, obviously, as it relates to health. Uh, but I would suggest, crucially, because of the consequences of movement and travel, uh, also for this fragile stability that may appear uh, in the Chinese economy uh, and a number of others that are so uh, crucially tied into the Chinese uh, influence on the world economy these days. Uh, and I suspect uh, this is hopefully going to be a major focus of attention of, uh, of Chinese policymakers and a number of others that may be in a position to help them. Uh, the uh, the f uh, fourth, I've got only two more comments you'll be pleased to know, then we shall break for reception. Uh, the fourth thing I would say, and linked to my opening comments, uh, I, I think you do uh, present, Mr. Secretary, um, a refreshing challenge to what I would call uh, is the status quo thinking of much of the past 25, 30 years, uh, of much of uh, international consensus. And now if I also put on my so-called Northern Powerhouse hat, I was particularly pleased uh, to hear you say of the importance of the context uh, of many of our international bodies uh, and thinking more about the consequences of some of the things that happen in international agreements for people uh, in their own economies. And uh, I, I hope you pass that over to uh, your counterpart at breakfast this morning because, uh, uh, as a number of people here know, this government seems to be at least giving the message that it wants to take the Northern Powerhouse more seriously. And it is really important that they do. Uh, but linking it to what uh, you've said, I think the thing that I have learned over the past, uh, now getting on for four years, since we had our own peculiar set of uh, self-presented challenges with the Brexit vote, it is perhaps the case that far too many countries have often pursued trade uh, as an end goal in itself and not in the context of the overall uh, domestic economic and social uh, economic policies. And whilst that means uh, there are huge challenges to the status quo of the likes of the WTO and, and touching on what you said about taxation, perhaps also to the likes of the OECD. Uh, it is incumbent on the people that are charged with running those organizations in order for them uh, to be more effective. Uh, I think it seems that they have to understand more some of these uh, domestic issues uh, that have come to the table so much in so many places. Uh, for individual parts of the world, uh, China, the EU, and ourselves, before I turn lastly to the EU, it also uh, obviously represents a challenge to those thinkers. Uh, and here, let me say, uh, it's an exciting challenge to all of us at Chatham House uh, and various people in our different research teams uh, to think of uh, a more productive way of how these countries can rise to this uh, uh, new set of how to think about uh, engaging with this approach from the US, uh, which I find my own mind thinking more and more may give the impetus to greater structural changes in their own economies, 
which in itself, if were to happen, will have a macroeconomic influence, presumably, uh, of giving more of their own stimulus to the world. And I strongly share uh, what Mr. Secretary suggested about uh, Europe itself finally discovering some kind of other forms of domestic economic growth rather than just relying on monetary policy, in my view. A highly welcome comment, and it is about time something happened. Let me uh, finish uh, specifically with respect to the UK, and I thank Joel there for asking uh, all, all the burning issues that indeed uh, uh, relate to the, uh, the many of the challenges of the UK-US bilateral trading discussions, and also to you, Mr. Secretary, for the candidness in which you replied to them. Uh, as also shown by our own very latest evidence, uh, just yesterday, our own purchasing managers' indices, or the so-called flash one in the UK, uh, showed a notable uh, bounce in December, which uh, uh, is, oh, sorry, for January, which is clearly uh, a response to the, the strength of the election victory and maybe some aspects of at least the formality of now leaving the EU uh, is with us. Uh, and that's a sign uh, of some kind of uh, perhaps stabilization coming from elsewhere in the world too. In parallel with that, uh, uh, somebody sent me yesterday, in fact, I, David Jampola, my friend here, uh, sent me a, a copy of the, the latest Edelman survey uh, of domestic opinions, both socially and economically. Uh, and the not so good side is that there's a lot of uh, pessimism uh, out there in the country, but flipping it to the other side, there has been a notable improvement uh, in a number of areas, both with individual perceptions uh, about their own sense of, of where the future is going. Uh, and it's very important, uh, in my opinion, that the government certainly carries uh, the focus on that uh, in what guides it into its own self-interest in its trade negotiations uh, with either the US or, for that matter, uh, anybody else. Uh, and so thank you again uh, for everybody's role in this. Uh, it's been an absolute pleasure uh, to come into the centre of town on a rare Saturday visit. Uh, <laughs> Uh, and uh, I'd now like to uh, all uh, ask you all to share again your uh, sense of appreciation for our guests uh, and then stay here, I'm just being reminded, while a, a few of us go up to the reception and if you can get anywhere near uh, Mr. Secretary through his colleagues, please try and feel free. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs>